Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. This Empowered series has been great. Who was here last Sunday? Good time of praying for each other. So uh, the Bruins won this weekend, and we get to talk about healing today. So doesn't get better than that. Uh, To start out, I want to tell you about my friend Landon. I met Landon when I was in second grade, uh, and she was actually um, being wheeled into school and participating in school from a hospital bed. They cleared away some desks, made space for the whole bed. Second graders, a cast is kind of cool. If you've got crutches, that's fun. People would like line up to bring her things and, and get stuff for her. As time progressed though, she moved from a walker to a a wheelchair. She has cerebral palsy. We fell out of touch for a while, but in college, she started following Jesus, met a group of Christians uh, at Quinnipiac State uh, University, had a like really radical faith uh, transformation. Um, So we got back in touch when she started going to the church that I went to in Connecticut super nice, super friendly. It's been wonderful to be in touch over the last 30 plus years now. We were in Connecticut, my husband and I, uh, at our home church. It's a great time of praying for for people and and everything, kind of like last week or something. And she comes up to to me and, and my husband says, could you pray for me? I'd really like to walk. So a bunch of us gather around her, pray over her, you know, in Jesus' name, strengthen uh, her, her muscles, her joints. We pray God's original intent over her physically. Pray blessing and love over her. I don't think after that prayer, there was any noticeable improvement in her physical state. A couple of years later, um, she's with some family and friends. Uh, We're from the Connecticut shoreline, boating. She's going to go get on a ferry to go to this little island um, and the Connecticut River, and her her family gets on, her mom gets on. She goes to get on the ferry, on this little gangplank thing, and the ferry pulls away. She is strapped in to a 300 pound wheelchair. She's always, I mean, if she isn't strapped in very soon in the day, that, that's fixed. Certainly to be wheeling around in a car and everything. Um, the canal is dredged for deeper ships. It's at least 20 feet deep in this canal and her wheelchair weighs over 300 pounds. No one there is equipped with a a knife, nor can most people swim that deep that fast. She's not physically strong. A couple of gulps of dirty river water will do her serious harm. Her mother, who weighs about 90 pounds soaking wet, jumps in to try to do something as she just surfaces right then and there. I don't know what happened under that water, whether it was an angel, whether it was a couple weeks later when they were able to obtain a big enough crane, they dredged her wheelchair out of the water. She had zero injuries. I don't know why God has not cured her cerebral palsy, given her the gift of walking but I do know that God has healed her spiritually and emotionally. She's a lawyer, went through law school, is actively practicing law, good group of friends, and I know for sure that God has saved her. Today we're going to be talking about healing. It's my hope that today we will see Jesus' power and love to heal, both then and now, and that we'll be a little bit more ready and willing to pray for others around us to receive healing. 
Uh, as we think about healing, um, sometimes we as Christians can think about healing as this really great advertisement for God. Like it's this like amazing door prize. If you get healed, like wow, you are definitely going to want to follow Jesus after that. Oprah gives away cars, Jesus gives away healing. Like, oh boy, th this is a great advertisement. Jesus gives this blessing, this happiness. You are definitely going to want to follow Jesus after this. Except that's not really how Jesus used healing. Half the time when he healed somebody, he told them, don't tell anyone about this. Matthew 9, two blind guys see that no one knows about this, raises Jairus' daughter from, from the dead, tells the parents, okay, parents, make sure no one knows about this. Now, obviously, we know about it. Word got out, but that was not the primary function of Jesus' healing. Um, so maybe it wasn't really advertising, but okay, this really like is a proof that Jesus is God and that he has the power. No one else can do this. Look at this. This is hardcore evidence of who Jesus is, except that's also really not how folks saw it back then, especially for the religious community. It was not proof of Jesus' divinity. It was suspicious paranormal activity that was not befitting godly order. People said that he cast out demons because he was demonic. It was viewed as problematic and, and, and negative, um, especially for those in the religious community. His healing actually detracted from his messianic legitimacy. The guy even healed on the Sabbath, which did prove something about him. It proved he was not a good Jew. Healing wasn't uh, for promoting or, or proving who Jesus was. Healing was just the whole package of salvation that Jesus came to bring to hurting folks around him. When we stop looking at healing like proof or, or persuasion and start looking at it as part of the total package of power and love that Jesus came to bring us, we are free to share the gift of healing as we share Jesus' help and saving love in our lives. Healing was controversial back then. It was too much, too risky, too fanatical, too controversial. Jesus wasn't deterred by that. Jesus' compassion was stronger than his motivation to prove himself or promote himself. Healing can be controversial now, but Jesus heals anyways because he loves us. So let's pray, and then we're going to study healing a little bit this morning. Jesus, you are not deterred. You're not deterred by people's questions or objections, by our hesitancies or like, really, how, why? You're not deterred. You just love us, love us, love us. So this morning, we open our hearts to your love. We let you in. And Jesus, this morning, you don't want to gather us together just to be good little Christians. You want to get close. You want to impact our thinking, get into our thoughts. You want to heal our hearts. You want to touch our bodies. So we open ourselves to you this morning. We say yes to your plans. We say yes to your healing today, Lord God. Would somebody be healed who's struggling with pain and hurt, Lord God, because of your compassion and your power? We thank you and praise you. We present ourselves before you. Would we believe who you are? Would we learn from your word? And would we follow you in all things? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys. Well, we're starting off with a shorter passage of scripture. But don't worry, we'll probably reference the Bible again as time goes on. Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. So she's held back in, in bed with a fever, real, real easy for Jesus to heal her. And then she's released to interact with Jesus, to serve Jesus. 
That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, He took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. This verse here is from Isaiah chapter 53 that talks about Jesus being despised and rejected for our sake. He was a man of suffering. He took our pain. Uh, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our uh, sins. We usually think of this passage as like about the cross, Jesus saving us. It's also about Jesus healing us. There's a cost to healing And the cost is on Jesus. Jesus came to die to save people from our sins. He also came to heal us and to make us whole. Healing and salvation are two sides of the same coin of total restoration that Jesus' love and power make possible in our life. We believe that Jesus heals today because Jesus saves today. We believe that Jesus heals today because we see happening in the Bible and we're not told like, guys, enjoy this while it lasts. It's going to cut out on you soon. We believe that Jesus heals today because Jesus' love and power are just as real today as they were before. Jesus saves today and Jesus heals today. Now, I've got a group of Christians here. I believe, you know, you're here Sunday morning instead of at brunch. So I presume everyone here, some type of Christian for the most part. In churches all across the country today, Christians are gathered. And most of us would agree, Jesus saves. There's something about Jesus, salvation, you know. Jesus saves is not particularly controversial. Jesus heals you will get a lot less agreement on that one across churches in America today. Why? Why are we hesitant to say Jesus saves? Like, that's a miracle, that's supernatural, that's not provable by science. But we're a little bit more hesitant to say Jesus heals. Well, I think there are a couple of things that might make us hesitant. The first one is a poverty mentality towards God that says God has more important things to do than deal with my problems. If God has more important things to do, like why do we pray about anything? Why do we pray about test grades? Why do we pray about finances? You are a child of God, loved and beloved and chosen, a son and daughter of God. If it matters to you, it matters to God. For most of us, our aches and our pains do matter to us, so it does matter to God. Or maybe there's a scientific thing, like cause and effect, I did this to myself. This is what happens, you fall off a ladder, you break break a leg, you know, if I smoke two packs of cigarettes every day and I get lung cancer, scientific cause and effect, I did this to myself. Most of my problems, I do to myself at least a little bit. I am involved in many of my problems, and God still loves to help me with it. Jesus loves us, and he wants to help us. Whatever the cause and effect is, he wants to heal and to save. We might have some false humility. Folks have been known to say, this is my cross, I have to bear it. I I need to follow God, even if he doesn't help me with, with things, even if God never did another thing for me. Like, really? Who told you that? It wasn't Jesus. Jesus says we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Jesus does not put a limit on what we can receive. He does not have a yearly deductible for us. If we are limited... That's because we have put that on ourselves. I was reading um, some books on healing this week, and one guy talked about this woman, older woman, who was starting to go blind, and uh, she didn't want to pray about for healing for it, though, because she thought God might be, you know, letting her get blind to prepare her for death. But she was very happy to go to an optometrist and have the optometrist try to, to heal her. 
some of us think that suffering is normal. It's life. It's how it is. It's how the world is. Suffering is not how it is supposed to be, though. Tim Keller, uh, who is not a crazy Pentecostal, he says that Christ's miracles are not the suspension of the natural order, but the restoration of the natural order. They're a reminder of what once was prior to the fall, how God intended it to be, and a preview of what will eventually be a universal reality again, a world of peace and justice without death, disease, or conflicts. Miracles are not interruptions in the normal badness of the world. Miracles are actually an inbreaking of the real normal of God's love and work and power. So you say, okay, okay, you know, God's plan is good, but life isn't meant to be all gumdrops and roses. Following Jesus is hard. I'm supposed to suffer for God. You know, the disciples, they all suffered for their faith, which, I mean, I do agree with. Uh, all of the disciples were killed for their faith except the one who got life in prison. Uh, so if we never have any problems, that's... Wow, it's amazing. We got off so much better than Jesus' best followers. But let me break down real quick, just like one minute, a biblical, a little bit more biblical normative model of suffering. Jesus took up his cross and he told his followers to also take up their cross. Um, but the cross is external and the cross is for a purpose. Paul said in uh, Corinthians 11, uh, Paul was a really good follower of Jesus, St. Paul. He lists off all of the sufferings that he had been through. Whipped three times, beaten five times, stoned once, shipwrecked. But he says that in all things, he is content and happy in and of himself. These are all external persecutions for a reason and a purpose. In and of himself, Paul said, I'm thriving, I'm happy. I've just got all of these uh, pressures that are pushing challenges and oppositions that are pushing in on me. We, we are meant to thrive and flourish and be challenged as we face opposition to do the work of God. We are meant to thrive and like struggle forwards, not plod and suffer in place. Uh, I've got a really beautiful graphic, um, yep. Um, we could very roughly summarize this as persecution is good, sickness is bad. V super rough summary. Jesus never looked at a sick person. We're never given an example in all of scripture where he looked at a sick person like, nah, I think this is good for you. But we are told that you know, people hate us for following Jesus. We will be poor, we will be driven out of towns. We're told that persecution it, opposition, challenge is good for us. Maybe, just maybe, maybe, perhaps, uh, because there's almost zero real persecution for American Christians, we let sickness take its place. Maybe we have so little opposition to the, the gospel that we substitute a different kind of internal suffering sometimes. Being healed and whole is what God wants for us. Now, there are lots of cases where people are not cured immediately, where we do indeed have to battle sickness. John Wimber, the founder of the vineyard, who um, prayed for thousands of people for healing, and the vineyard was really founded with healing, successful healing ministry. He himself passed away from cancer at only age 63. But we believe that contrary to this whole list of objections or hesitations, we believe that God has plenty of time and energy for us, that he cares for us, that he does not let us stew in our own mistakes, and that his plan for us is not suffering. Jesus heals because Jesus saves because he rescues us and he helps us in every way. The Bible tells us of a time when uh, Jesus was going along and uh, he saw a man who had been born blind from birth. 
Rabbi, the disciples asked, was this, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sin? Who messed up, A or B? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. Jesus answered, this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out our tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. Night is coming when no one can work. This is his death. But while I am here, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with his saliva, spread the mud over the blind man's eyes, told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. The man went washed himself because you would want to get that off your face and came back seeing. Folks are like, what happened to our neighbor beggar, neighborhood beggar? Is that him? No, no way. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Excuse me, do you not even recognize me? Hello, I've been around here forever. <sighs> okay, well, tell me how you got healed. Funny story. It was with spit and mud mm -hmm. and uh, who helped you with this well I saw him even though I was blind but now you can't see him because he's left everyone starts investigating this big controversy because he was healed on the Sabbath the whole thing is controversial divisive ridiculous, kind of crass with the spitting and the dirt, definitely confusing. Again, Jesus doesn't heal to make himself look good, which he doesn't particularly. He heals to save this man, spiritually and physically. There was not much of a market for blind men, not much of a future for him, nor is there much of a spiritual hope for those who are trapped in sin, whether it is thought to be theirs or their parents. His disciples say, who sinned, this man or his parents? The disciples connect sin and sickness totally. Jesus doesn't. He just beats both. Sin and sickness are both things that Jesus is not okay with. Healing and salvation are both things that Jesus came to accomplish for us. Our body and our soul are more connected than we think. You know, when my daughter is, hung, not this daughter, the other one, when my daughter is uh, hungry and tired or in pain, she's a little grumpy, so am I. And oftentimes we, we give kids a little bit more of a pass for this. If a baby has, you know, an earache, we expect that they're crying and fussy. If a 10-year-old has new braces, we give them a little bit of a pass for being irritable. But then when it comes to adults, we think, oh, we should be able to totally separate the two. That's not realistic. We're connected and integrated people. Back in Jesus' time, the Greeks separated body and soul. The body was carnal and sinful. The soul could be pure. Jesus didn't divide people into a body that needed to suffer and a soul that needed to be saved. And Christian thinkers from Augustine to Luther to vineyard pastors don't separate the two either. Whole is holy. Whole is holy. As we talk about healing, what, what specifically do we mean? You know, what, what, what is it? People in uh, healing ministry circles and really the Christian church throughout the last 2,000 years really have talked about four types of prayer for healing. The first is healing from our sin, from the junk and garbage that is not supposed to be there, repentance. Um, we are able to be cleansed from what pollutes us, and it feels so good uh, to repent and be forgiven. Then there's also prayer for inner healing. Our emotional problems, bitterness, jealousy, uh, things that are just really not resolved in us. The core of this is forgiving others, is forgiving others, not holding on to hurt 
and bitterness. Again, when we are he healed emotionally, it feels so good. And then what we're focusing on a little bit more today is physical sickness, healing um, physically. You know, I know people who have been healed of arthritis miraculously and quickly. My cousin um, had one leg shorter than the other, um, which is probably why she was put in uh, an orphanage, had an adorable little limp. Folks in her youth group as a teenager, pretty ordinary, 15, 16 year olds prayed for her. I don't know if like one leg shortened, the other leg stretched, what well, went on there, but now same length, no limp. Folks here have been healed and cured of a variety of problems, mental, emotional, physical. I've got a number of folks here who say, Jesus has healed me. Uh, and then the last uh, type of, of healing is deliverance. Um, there's some real forces of evil out there that sometimes get a little bit of a hook into us. We're going to talk about that next week, so come back next week. But we see from this again the interconnectedness of body and soul, a spiritual salvation and, and physical healing, and the desire of Jesus to, to heal us and to save us all just wrapped in to one thing. Now, for me, I do think that healing can be intimidating. I do not think that I am, you know, good at praying for healing. I don't say, oh, like I've got all the, this confidence. I have experienced it. Um, and Bill Johnson says, we don't have the luxury of doing what we're good at. And that really resonates with me. It is not about what I can do. It is about what God can do. We do not have the luxury of saying, healing? Oh, no, no, no. I can't do that. Because God can. We cannot take things off the menu if they are indeed available in the kitchen. There is so much that God is good at. We cannot say, no, no, no. We cannot limit ourselves to what we're good at because there's so much God is good at. We're responsible to God and he's responsible for the results. So folks usually say, okay, you've convinced me. Jesus loves us. He has power. He's still saving and healing today. What do I do? Is there some magic word to say, this seems like a big challenge. I'm sweating already. Tell me what to do. I don't think that there's any one right way or wrong way to pray for healing. The only wrong way to pray for healing is to not pray for healing. That said, the Vineyard has uh, some helpful guidelines for us. Um, I've got a little bit of a modified five-step prayer model for us today. To pray for healing, we've got to have something that's, you know, a cause for healing. We talk to people. We just have normal conversations. Sometimes the Vineyard calls this the interview. You're having a conversation with someone. They say something that's wrong, that, that's hurting them, that's holding them back. Or you say, hey, how can I pray for you? Say, well, you know, I do have this problem. We don't need the Holy Spirit to shine like a laser pointer or to highlight everything, ding, 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 like this is it. You're talking to someone. They have something that's wrong, painful, hurtful. We're like, no, God doesn't want that for you. Let's pray. Then prayer's not just up to us, obviously. We wait for the Holy Spirit. We listen for a minute. Just pause. I've heard your presenting claim. Let's hear what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Let's get his guidance. What do you have to say to us here, Holy Spirit? And you know what? He's going to speak love. He's going to speak encouragement. That little pause where you, you've heard their problems, now you hear the Holy Spirit's perspective. That is always a like, come on, let's go thing. Uh, one ear to the other person, one ear to the Holy Spirit. And then you pray. Very simple, but specific. In Jesus' name, pain be gone. Name the problem. In Jesus' name, healing. Nothing fancy, nothing elaborate. Just say, here it is. In Jesus' name.
Now, how do you know if your prayer is working yet? Well, the person you're praying for is standing right there in front of you. You can ask them. Uh, so we do a little check-in. You feeling anything? What's happening? Um, how are you feeling? They'll say, oh, I feel amazing, totally healed then. Praise Jesus. Uh, say, oh, you know, I feel good, but uh, there could be more. Keep praying. You don't have to, like, cut it off immediately. Like, there, we did it. Lean in, press in, keep praying. Um, but we can, we've got a feedback loop for how our prayers are going. It's talking, um, set, checking in with the person who's being healed. For us, truly, friends, the only wrong way to pray for healing is to not pray. The only time I have ever regretted anything around the topic of healing is not doing it. I have never regretted praying for someone to be healed. I have only regretted not praying for someone to be healed. Jesus loves us, and Jesus wants to work in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls. Jesus loves us, and he wants to save us and heal us. Mm -hmm.